Dr. Bonnie Schmidt is the founder and president of Let's Talk Science. It's an award-winning national Canadian charitable organization that she started way back in 1991. Let's Talk Science helps children and youth fulfill their potential and prepare for their future careers and citizenship roles by supporting their learning through science, technology, engineering, and math engagement. We had a great conversation about Let's Talk Science starting off, um, its intent, its direction, and how it sees the future of education across our beautiful Canadian um, country. Uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation and, and please be sure to check out Let's Talk Science. There's so much there for educators um, here in Quebec, but also across the country. Enjoy. Shifted podcast here again. What a pleasure do I have today. Um, I am welcoming the founder CEO of Lex, Let's Talk Science, a, a, a Canada-wide service. Bonnie Schmidt is uh, with us here today to kind of, well, maybe not kind of, to talk about science and why it's important and maybe a little look into our future. Um, things change so quickly, um, hence this podcast shifted. Um, we are continuously shifting and adapting, and Bonnie's going to shed some light for us on some of um, our STEM or STEAM education. So, Bonnie, thanks so much for hopping on here today. It's a real, real pleasure to talk to you. Oh, I'm delighted to be here, Chris. And I have to say, I love the name of the podcast. It's really future oriented and recognizing that everything is changing. Everything is shifting. So thrilled to be here. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it kind of spurred out of the pandemic where we were just trying to connect people together through these casts, but it's evolved now into, yeah, looking at the shifting nature. Bonnie, I'd like to start off always by just kind of maybe getting a little bit about you. Um, how, do, how did you get involved in, maybe not particularly let's talk science, but how did you kind of, what were your stepping stones to get into, um, you know, science, math, STEAM education? What was your catalyst? Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually a wonderful time to be able to reflect and reflect out loud because we're just wrapping up our 30th anniversary with and I started Let's Talk Science, so like 32 years ago as, as a project. But if I think back to when I was younger, <clears throat> my mom was a trained nurse. And so I was in an environment in which health and life sciences were often talked about. But like so many other people, I think my real interest in, in science, and I have to say biology in particular, was inspired by a high school teacher who was so animated in bringing biology and life sciences to life. I couldn't help but really lean in. I was also really fortunate, and this was like way back in the 80s, which is dating myself, but I had a peer group of, of other young female students who were all leaning into science. So this whole cohort was almost um, an assumption that we would continue on in a science-based discipline. And for me, at that point in time, I was really leaning into dentistry, interestingly enough. And that's a whole other podcast <laughs> as to what right. happened there. Exactly. So I was really interested in life sciences, a little bit in the medical side, but never really was interested in being a doctor, was interested in dentistry, continued on to a university in which I failed my first year physics and calculus course and by year four, everything was going well when it came to you know performance on on tests and whatnot. But when I did the dental entry exam, it, I like failed the manual dexterity <laughs> carving <laughs> test twice. Okay, on the content side, realized I have no spatial orientation whatsoever, <laughs> and found myself at, at at odds. So I had done this undergrad degree in science and found that I had no plan B because I was just so stereotyped into thinking if I had a science training, then there was one of, you know, three or four jobs that I could do, was rescued by a female scientist, one of the few at the time at, uh, at Western University, and pursued mm -hmm. a graduate training. And so my love for life sciences in particular, my uh, lack of performance in math and physics and my lack of a uh, plan B really, really fed into the beginning of Let's Talk Science, which I did start while I was doing a PhD in physiology. 
in the early 90s during the economic recession in which funding to scientific research was really cut. And at that mm -hmm. point in time, we really just had the three granting councils, right? The Medical Research Council, NSERC, which still exists, and SHRC, which also still exists. And there was really no outreach that was happening at the time. So I found myself in a post-secondary environment doing research at a time when there was really not much connection with community and the research community and a point in time when funding to the research enterprise was, was cut quite significantly. So the stars aligned. You can dig into the formation of the organization if you want at that point in time, but that really got me to a place of recognizing that some, something needed to be done. Right. It's fascinating too I, that you mentioned that that spark came from a teacher. Um, and I just had a, a, a podcast with a, another educator who said the exact same thing, that all the content in the world wouldn't have influenced them to do a certain thing other than that relationship that they had with that teacher. And it just sparked his love for, similar to what you were just mentioning, which I find the power of a teacher and those relationships we just yeah. we can't overlook those particularly at a start of a new school year right where that's where you're starting to create those foundations of relationships um and yeah. trust with your students um, well that you know the critical role of a teacher is, is actually at the heart of everything we do at let's talk science you know 30 years later we know that teachers are enablers or catalysts they induce these sparks and they really shape young people in a critical way and they need support. So that's what yes. uh, some of the, <laughs> the work that we do. <laughs> right, right. So 1991 was when Let's Talk Science began. It's this journey that it's still on today. What was what were some of the intents when you first started? You had mentioned community connections. What were some of your objectives when you were starting um, this organization? So back in 1991, I have to say it was incredibly naive, right? So what was really happening in the environment was funding to the research enterprise was, was really being cut quite significantly. My father was a teacher. He taught history and economics in the London community. And I, I really just felt that there was a lack of connection between the university and the school environment. So very simplicity, simply, I sent out notes to high school teachers in the science areas around London and asked if they'd be interested in having better access to the university to learn more about the, the STEM programming. And there was no acronym mm -hmm. back then. So like, you know, with the science mm -hmm. programming, there was such interest that in the early days, it was really just about connecting graduate students with teachers in London to figure mm -hmm. out what was it that teachers needed in order to be able to access the resources. So it, it, the early years, it was about research, but it didn't take long before, A, I finished my PhD in 93. And by that point in time, there were several universities really interested in what we were doing in the London community. A lot of interest from the school boards and some donors to say, let's, let's dig into this opportunity to connect post-secondary better into the school environment. And that's really when a more concerted journey began to understand what teachers needed, how they were or weren't being supported at the time, what was going on with curriculum, how do you actually make a tent that's big enough to bring everybody in. And so I'd say 1993 is really when the formal Let's Talk Science okay. journey began. But at the beginning, it was really simple. Let's just connect mm -hmm the community right. to ensure that young people had a continuous pathway and teachers had continuous access to resources and people. Wow. wow. And I guess Canada is such a interesting kind of country in the sense for its educational, um, there's no central ministry across the, uh, the country. We have provincial ministries of education that create the curriculum and Yet we have universities across Canada that take in students from all those different provinces. Is there a common thread you find throughout all the provinces' educational systems that 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 thread together the sciences in a common way, so that when universities are or you know employees are taking kids on or, or students on, that they have a base foundation of science or STEAM? 
That is such an insightful question. To be honest, if I had understood the complexity of the learning and education ecosystem when I set out on this journey in 1993, I might have thought twice about thinking about <laughs> national education, right? Because right, right now, there's right. about 22 or more provincial territorial ministries that are responsible for early years, K-12 and post-secondary. It Yes, it's fragmented a lot. <laughs> and it's the only developed, we're the only developed country in the world that does not have a national or a federal department ministry of education. So that aside, mm -hmm. what we have at Let's Talk Science developed is a quite a great expertise and a depth of ability to look at curriculum across the country and identify where there's points of commonalities. Because yes, every province and territory develops their own curriculum every subject and every grade but you know there really is there, there's key themes and one of the one of the best things that did happen from a science perspective was back in 1999 when the council of ministers of education which is the only table where you do have national conversations about education mm -hmm. because all the ministers are there but in 1999, they did do the pan-Canadian framework on uh, science protocol. And that, that provided a long-lasting framework for curriculum development, for curriculum developers as they were creating provincial territorial uh, policies for science. So that has actually led to at least, you know, big, broad brushstrokes of commonality across the country, uh, according to age, stage, grade and topic area, which has been quite helpful and, you know, a bit of a plug. I'd love to see something like that happen again, because we need we need yeah. more. We need better. We need updating at that mm -hmm. post-secondary level. You know, you could actually take a look at some of the research. Let's Talk Science has done a spotlight on science learning reports, for example, in which we have looked at what are the entry requirements for post-secondary. And mm -hmm. that's a bit of a double-edged sword because we do see that many of the requirements haven't changed over the years at all. And we'd love to see mm -hmm. changes happening there, but they are really common, right? They're like grade 12 chemistry, grade 12 biology, grade 12 calculus. So those are, those tend to be commonalities right across the, okay. right across the country. And there are some assumptions that there might need to be a bit of, you know, maybe backfiller changes that happen when you get into first year. But again, we could do a whole other mm -hmm. podcast on that, that, that yeah. difficult, difficult transition from high school into post-secondary and mm -hmm. the also the awareness raising that needs to happen for young people and educators about the requirement for STEM optional credits at high school and how they will help build bridges to college, to polytechnics, to skilled trades. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, we over we overlook the vo our vocational trades too often, I find, yeah. where there's such a wealth and 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 a need um for those types of people to go into those areas. Mm -hmm. But it's always kind of been seen as, you know, the second choice, you know, university is obviously your first choice. And then like, I, again, I think other countries don't see it in those lights, you know, they see them as equal value, um, which is, again, I don't know, the diversity we have or, um, um, and we call things differently to... too, right? Like we got college, right. polytechnic, SAGEP, universities, they all kind of come right. in together under a post-secondary banner. But what's been really interesting is the thread of STEM through all of those areas. And, you know, rightly or wrongly, people's attitudes towards different pathways and depending mm -hmm. on, on where you're coming from, they might have different biases against any of the pathways, but STEM is so important for science, technology, engineering, and math. I know we'll talk about acronyms in a bit, but mm -hmm. the, um, the, that whole thread of importance, regardless of the post-secondary pathway is largely undiscussed in the country. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I totally, like most educators, when I go and meet with them or talk with them or we do workshops or webinars or whatnot, aren't aware of those acronyms um, as much as I thought they would be. Um, sometimes like we'll talk with the students about it and we'll have to, we'll do a de guessing game as to what it might stand for as a subject in your school. Um, most of the time they get it. The E is a little tricky for them. <laughs> They're not really quite sure, but um, so tell me a little bit about like, why is it that steam is like, so important in your opinion like what does it do for a student 
that might later grow well will later grow up and and move into the workforce what is it about steam education that you find crucial at this at this time in life for us if you look at our mission statement at let's talk science it's actually about helping kids fulfill their potential and prepare for career and citizenship demands and so for us, it's really more about the learning platform to help young people understand the world around them, to stay curious about how the world is working, and to develop the kinds of skills and knowledge that they're going to need to be engaged citizens and prepare for workplace changes, right? We talk a lot about jobs of the future and, and how it's very difficult to identify what jobs are going to be there. But having a solid STEM, STEAM, let's talk about acronyms and blowing them up and getting rid of them at some point in time. But uh, you know, thinking about the critical competencies that we need to really be ready to thrive the way the world is changing. And there's fewer than six and a half million kids in this country. So the idea that we can leave any of them behind, like that's 20% fewer kids in all of this country than there are in the state of California. We just simply can't afford to not ensure they're all ready to meet the challenges of the future, whether mm -hmm. or not they're going into traditional science technology-based jobs, or they're working in environments in which that comfort level and that, uh, you know, the acceptance and understanding of, of how science might happen is actually mm -hmm. there. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Really good point. And let's let's crash up some some of these acronyms. Like, yeah. we always thought that that A in, in STEM in the STEAM was was important because in art, you have all of those. I mean, the STEAM factors. Um, what what's what's the mindset in in let's talk science of of just having it stem and i know that that that's quite common throughout the world is is stem mm -hmm. and this a has been added but I, I i saw your ted talk where you were kind of talking about that a little bit of i mean we could have acronyms till the wazoo if we wanted to um can you can you elaborate on that a little bit the the, the that difference between steam and stem for sure. I, and, you know, our name can actually be a bit of a limitation, right? With Let's Talk Science. To be right. totally truthful, we only adopted the STEM acronym about a decade ago when I think it was the, the National Science Foundation started to use it in some of the international work. And so it was almost mm -hmm. more of a provocation to say, let's actually align with some of the language that was coming out in, in a variety of different agencies around the world. It really didn't have anything to do with whether or not we appreciated arts because we are an organization that deeply appreciates the arts. And I would argue mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. our new programming, especially that developed over the last say five years, the big projects, they are integrated, they are holistic, right. they are multidisciplinary. And Rather than do step changes of saying we're going to change our original acronym that we adopted, you know, a decade ago mm -hmm. to another mm -hmm. acronym, our focus has been how do we get rid of the acronyms? How do we right. get people talking more about multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, integrated approaches that build competencies? How do we layer in some of the innovative thinking? the creative thinking into our programming such that young people are really leveraging their whole brain. This isn't about okay. teaching subjects at Let's Talk Science. This is really mm -hmm. about understanding, engaging, meaningful, relevant learning platforms that are largely issues focused because let's face it, young people want to be tackling issues that are relevant mm -hmm. and important to them, not memorizing definitions. So we've right. really focused on how do we take an integrated approach to create really meaningful programming. And that's one of the reasons I, you know, why we haven't really just jumped to change acronyms, but how do we have a whole mm -hmm. scale change to talk about <laughs> competency, skills, career awareness, yes. you know, building kids who are really ready for the future. Right. Right. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, it, I, it, we're building a whole child, a whole citizen, um, and oftentimes, as you were mentioning, the silos tend to not talk to one another. Um, another fascinating thing when I was watching your TED talk was you showed two pictures of classroom back in your time when we, you know, in our schooling time, and then you fast forward to 
nowadays and the similarity were very stark um similar <laughs> very similar um how, how do we get this shift going how do we get change i know it takes a long time in education to get the balls rolling what is in your experience been some of like the wins or the aha moments where we can mobilize here's some techniques or strategies that we use where we actually saw these shifts starting to happen away from the rows and the memorization and the summative exams to more of a holistic um mm -hmm. approach to learning yeah it's a, it, it's a really really important thing i think in you know my reflection change change is scary change yeah. is hard is. and the way that we do govern education with you know, deep, big curriculum policy documents for every single grade and every single topic area or subject area does put limits on how flexible and, and how integrated teachers can be. So you do see change at the elementary level in which teachers have control over larger chunks of time and control over more subject areas we are seeing some wonderful gains and a key message for us for teachers is to know you're not alone that this mm -hmm. is you know uh, letting go of some of the stereotypes of the past in which yes i i sat in rows in every single elementary <laughs> class i'm dating myself now because i don't see <laughs> quite so much of that as as was experienced mm -hmm. before but at the same time, often K to eight teachers don't have a science background and often haven't worked outside of a school system. So that lack of comfort or a feeling of identity themselves in, in how do you ask the kinds of questions that might foster really meaningful science-based or STEM-based programming, it can be tough. If, you, if you're mm -hmm. not trained in that way, you might not recognize that it's actually easier than you think. And letting go of the idea that you, you need to be the sage on the stage. One of the best things I've seen over the last decade, though, is a real, real, real feeling that that is shifting, that teachers really want to, to do great things by their students. They're, they're incorporating new pedagogy. They're trying. They're taking risks and getting kids leaning into innovative thinking on human-centered design. We're doing a lot more of that around Let's Talk Science as well. And, and getting a, a better handle on the barriers as to why kids don't stay engaged in the STEM areas, which we can talk to, um, talk to if you like. We've really, uh, the robust programming that we've been developing over the last uh, many years identifies the tackle, uh, tackles the barriers, really thinks about making it relevant to the youth regardless of the age and stage they're at. So like what's meaningful to a student who's in grade two versus what's really meaningful and relevant to a student who might be in grade 10 or grade 11. And we've really built our programs in, in that particular way. And we, we've taken a real collegial approach. So teachers who we are ser here to serve and support are part of our development cycle. And so we really are hearing like what's worrying you, what's hard to prep, what takes your time, how can you help influence what we do in order to make your job easier. So teaching can often be seen as an isolating profession. And we're also here to say, sure. you know, ask for help, seek help. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You don't have to have all the answers. Right. right, right. But again, it's, it's breaking some of those norms yeah. that have just because you teach the way you were taught, really, right? T teachers tend to, to to follow the same sequences that that they were taught in, um, and it's yeah, it's, it's that awareness, and then saying, I could I could tweak this, or I could tweak that, or I could go across the hall and talk to the teacher and engage in something we could do together. Um, so yeah, there's lots of opportunities out there for sure. Um, I wanted to just kind of ask you too about Canada 2067 which is an initiative to, to, to start shaping. I mean, we have a lot of time left, um, but <laughs> how, how has this initiative been going? And could you talk to us a little bit about it and, and kind of like its direction where it wants to go to or sure. it, ho it hopes to go to? Yeah, well, I'll clarify that Canada 2067 was really a time delineated project that we did during the sesquicentennial sesquicentennial celebrations in 2017 right okay. so it, it really it, it has kind of closed as a project but we're using the outcomes 
all the time. And just to flash back in in twenty six, sorry, in twenty seventeen, we set out to have a nation building exercise that really engaged all levels from youth to educators, to policymakers, to industry leaders, to help think about the future of STEM education, defining a vision, understanding the key parameters. And we we did that. We did public polling. We had hundreds of thousands of responses from people as we were asking for input on what should the future look like. We had five youth summits across the country in which we facilitated discussions with high school students. What would they like to see? How would they like to to be moving forward? We held the only national conference that brought together federal deputy ministers who had oversight with some aspect of learning and development and the um, deputies and ADMs across Canada as part of the Council of Ministers of Education table and many leaders. We had the Canadian Teachers Federation there as well and, and many others. So we brought all of that data together. You can still find the youth report, which we produced as a book, and all of the supporting materials that we did because we also worked with the Global Shapers Network to hold tables with these young professionals who are part of the Global Shapers Network. All of it's available through our website. And it all rolled up to some of the key elements that really strong STEM teachers already know, and that is you know, kids want an integrated approach to learning. We need to make it relevant. We need to be thinking better and more about how to connect jobs of the future so young people are aware of the opportunities. Because one of the key barriers that exists is, A, they don't see it relevant for today and what they're learning. Mm-hmm. And B, they don't understand post-secondary pathways, regardless of which pathway it is, and the jobs. So that was coming through on everything. And then the need, nobody's going to open up the constitution for sure and change, you know, who's got responsibility for education, but the need to have more alignment and more communication and, you know, easier adaptability. Again, efficiencies in this country, we do not have a big population. We have massive landmass, but not a big population. So we need to be thinking differently and, and more creatively. Some of those core outcomes and the research findings that we had have been peppered and infused and undergird all of our program development. One of the best things we learned was the importance of youth voice and how smart the kids are and how deeply, deeply committed they are to contributing in meaningful ways. So when we started our journey on climate change education a few years ago and really wanting to change how we were approaching environmental education and climate education, we did another research project in which we hired, I think it was about 85 high school students from right across the country to be doing peer ethnographic research to understand, layering into what they were saying in Canada 2067, to understanding and focused more on what are they saying about the kinds of learning experiences they want and need in order to uh, you know, provoke positive, hopeful climate action for themselves. Yeah. So everything that we've been developing for that, for that whole area, that sector yeah. is totally based on what students, young people were telling us, Amazing. building on Canada 2067. Amazing. I'll include that report in our, our notes for this podcast, because uh, I'm going to pull it up and read it uh, a lot more. Um, yeah. To kind of bring things in uh, to a close, Bonnie, thanks again, first off. Um, your words are so insightful and your passion comes through very deeply about yeah. this STEAM, STEM and STEAM and Canada and education and our youth. Um, just fascinating. And I just want to thank you for that. Um, what what offerings does um, Let's Talk Science offer out for our educators that they can go and get. And I, and I believe most of this is free, right? Or all of it is free, Bonnie? All of it's free and all of it's available in English and French. If you go to the Let's Talk Science website and go to the all program, all programming page, there's actually a link on the very top of every, every web page. It describes the in-person, the online programming that we have for both students and educators from early childhood to grade 12, 
We offer, for example, in-person workshops in partnership with our volunteer network. That is just an amazing world-class network of young STEM students from university, colleges. Uh, we also have quite a lot of industry who are getting involved, but our 55 mm -hmm. outreach partner sites will go into classrooms, go into library settings, community groups for free to be tackling that Mithran stereotypes and, and role models. So they are bringing their passion, their studies to bear doing hands-on activities. So we do thousands of those uh, programs every year. We also have virtual programming that teachers can tune in and actually have the kids doing activities uh, like a Zoom session, but we would have hundreds of classrooms that are participating at the same time, from story time for primary classes to STEM club for the junior classes to curious careers and visionary symposiums and virtual symposiums for high school students. So we have multiple points of entry for every single grade level now. We have a larger scale projects like Tomato Sphere, which might be familiar to some of your listeners. We have Clothing for Climate, Travel for Climate, Lunar Rover Research Challenge. We've got a brand new project called Mission Innovation. So taken together, we have so many opportunities. And then, of course, we have a very deep focus on professional learning and support mm -hmm. teachers singularly with a whole suite of programming, which I'm super excited about. We've organized it all into a micro-credentialed pathway called the, the Learning Pathways. Just cool. finished level one. So you can come and do it all and get this certification, or you can do parts of it, you know, that fit you and what you, what kind of time uh, teachers have. Again, all free, English and French. And one of the newer additions over the last couple of years is this wonderful network of teacher leaders. This year, we have a hundred of them. These are classroom educators who have the support of their, their board or their school to be working with Let's Talk Science in delivering our professional learning program. So you've got a peer process, a coaching process in place. We have a hundred of them now all over the country. And it's really amplifying the importance of peer-led professional learning and coaching the need to be developing networks, professional networks and community of practice. And it aligns with our goals and our visions to be a capacity builder, to be an enabler, to help everybody like move forward and make sure that our, our all of the, the young people in this country, regardless of where they are, their backgrounds, their financial abilities, that they're all engaged in meaningful, relevant programming that gets them really ready for the future. Absolutely. Amazing. I love your programming. I love your organization, what you guys do. Um, I know it helps teachers, students, um, and you have such a variety. So I encourage you out there, if you're teaching science in elementary and you're kind of not really sure about it and you're going to that textbook, go to Let's Talk Science first and there's support there for you. Um, Bonnie, this has been outstanding. Thanks again so much. Um, Thanks, Chris. I wish you all the the success in the continuation with Lexoc Science. Um, I think it's an integral part now of, of the Canada educational landscape. Um, and I'd love to do another chat with you. I mean, we touched on so few things and I know that there's so much more we could talk about. Um, I'd love that. I'd love that. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I wish you a great day um, and we'll see each other soon. And I wish everyone an amazing start to the school year. It's just such a fresh, you know, a fresh <laughs> canvas to, to be contributing. So best to everybody and do any, any teacher, not just a science teacher, but any teacher. Use Let's Talk yes. Science as a first stop. We've got definitely got something for you. I'd love to talk to you again, Chris. Excellent. Thanks so much, Bonnie. Thanks.